Jason Turner. And Jason has two decades of C++ experience and is a regular conference speaker, developer, and trainer. He is the host of this YouTube channel, C++ Weekly, and also a co-host of CPP Cast. This is the first ever podcast for C++ um, developers. And, well, privately, Jason is neither a runner or a dancer, but nevertheless does both regularly. And he's also a big fan of European Christmas markets, so he's looking forward to Wrocław opening one this coming Friday. And, well, let's fasten our seatbelts because, as it turns out, C++ code smells, and proving that will be Jason Turner. So uh, that introduction where I said, um, you said I am neither a dancer or a runner, but I do both regularly. Interestingly, I've been doing a lot of training with physicists recently. And uh, just out of curiosity, who here actually, uh, no, let's uh, see if I can flip this around. And just for the record, I need to see everyone, which is almost impossible with this lighting. So if I retreat to this corner, it's because I'm behind a light and I can actually see you. Um, who, who would say that they are a scientist and not a programmer? Is there, are there people here that are? Okay. There's just a couple people in the room. I didn't expect a huge amount. So those of you who just raised your hands, you say you're a scientist, not a programmer. How much of your day do you spend programming? Go ahead. Can you, how much of your day do you spend programming? An hour or two. An hour or two? Someone in the back, can you yell out, like, you said you were a scientist. How much of your day do you spend programming? So you used to be a scientist, but now you code all the time. I think, like, we just... So you used to code all the time as a physicist as well. Yeah, like we have like this mental picture of ourselves that doesn't necessarily line up with what we do. I run about 16 kilometers a week and I go dancing at least once a week with my wife. But if you were to ask me, I don't think of myself as either of those things. It's, I don't know, just weird. I'm weird. Okay, uh, so yeah, this is what, things that were already in my introduction. A Microsoft MVP as well, some of the projects I work on. And I was also thinking about getting a screen like this for my house. Although this would take up most of my house, at least. Well, the room would easily be bigger than my house. <coughs> okay, uh, yeah, so I am independent and available for contracting. That's what I do. Now, uh, I like to say move to the front. That's not going to work here. The front is full. Um, but you have to interrupt me and ask questions. So when I'm expecting questions, I really am going to retreat to my little corner and there's nothing they can do about it. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Okay. So the name of the talk is C++ best practice, uh, excuse me, C++ code smells. We're going to start by talking about some best practices. Um, there are 400, what, let's see. 496 C++ core guidelines, 42 items in effective modern C, uh, excuse me, yeah, effective modern C++. That doesn't count effective C++, more effective C++, or uh, effective STL. I've got my own C++ best practices guidelines, and there's about 109 items in there. And then there's this book from Andre Alexandrescu and Herb Sutter called C++ Coding Standards that's got 101 items in it. So from just these four resources, we've got 748 best practices. Sounds like a lot. A lot of questions for me. How many of these are unique? Anyone have any idea? I don't, just for the record. How many of them are important that we need to be paying attention to in all the code that we write? Which ones can tools tell us about? So related to this, uh, Herb Sutter in his CVPCon keynote 2018 said, we don't have to teach things that all compilers warn on. Well, you need to know what things that the compilers warn on, though. 
So code smells. According to Wikipedia, a code smell is a, uh, in computer programming is an a characteristic in the source code of a program that can possibly indicate a deeper problem. Now, slightly contrary to my introduction, I am not here to convince you that C++ code smells. Okay, I'm here to talk about C++ code smells. Do we, do we get the difference here? We're talking about things in our C++ code that should make us wrinkle our nose up. Um, so I'm asking, the, the entire point of this talk when I prepared it was, can I swap around the best practices and instead of saying there's hundreds of 800 things or whatever to look for, can we reduce this to a set of smells, and does that reduce the set of things that we have to look for in our C++? So I asked Twitter for their favorite C++ code smells, which, by the way, I did get a few people saying, favorite code smells? That's weird. OK. So what do we think of this code? I'm just going to stand here until someone starts yelling things out. That's how this is going to work. Copy. Uninitialized variable and initialized STR, yes? Ooh, we'll get there in just a second. I won't repeat that yet. Wait, wait, what's that? Sorry? Variable is never used after assignment. Okay, I will give you that, but this is what we know as slideware, right? So there's going to be a few things in here that, yeah, it's not practical code, but just for the record, every single one of my examples on these slides should compile. And if you care, you can go to the Godbolt link there, and it should be the exact uh, code as well. Definition far from first use. Okay, so. Construction and assignment, that was the crux of what we were, uh, most people were saying. We were defining a variable and then we're assigning it. There's a comment about const. So uh, from uh, Ben Dean here on my Twitter poll, uh, was this construction separate from assignment? So I can declare the variable str and give it a value at the same time. Now, let's see. We can, we can interact with all of my slides, too, if we want to. So um, this is, we're not going to dig into assembly today. I'm not planning to. I mean, you can if you want to, or you can ask me questions. But just for the record, if I run this, or if I compile this program, I've got a fair bit of code generated. The compiler has to deal with the fact that I asked for a default constructed string, and then I assigned to it. If I do the value and declar assignment declaration on the same line, the compiler is able to completely see through this. And it's able to optimize the entire result away. So at the moment, we're just saying more assembly bad, less assembly good. That's not always true, though. Okay, from Ben. Um, what about this? I heard an ew, an ew. Did you did you smell something? <laughs> what? Sorry. Output arguments. Ar output arguments. Okay, uh, out variables from Ollie here. Um, so we swap this around. I have something that is passing in a reference, and then I am probably assigning it somewhere versus this one. I'm returning a string. One. <laughs> So I'm getting interaction from the front row. Now, this is the problem for those of you who chose to sit in the back row, way back there. OK. Um, so the answer I got from the front row was one, one parameter. Does anyone see that parameter? Yeah, go ahead, yell, yell. Space for the result. 
So the compiler, yes, when we call a function, we have to say, hey, where is this return value going to end up living? That, that's something that has to be done. So ultimately, we could argue that this actually takes one parameter, and it is where the return value would go. And if we, I, I, don't, I wasn't planning to go into this bunch of assembly right now, but I guess I am. It's where we are. OK. So I am actually setting up stack space, and I am storing that stack space in RDI. RDI is the first parameter on the 64-bit calling conventions for Intel. And then I am calling my function. So I have set something up for the first parameter to this function, and that is the stack space where the return string is going to live. All right. So out variables. Uh, also, um, Sean Parent has a uh, very well-written article up here called Start, uh, Stop Using Out Arguments that you can check out if you would like. What do we think of this code? Let's see. I've got some process data. I'm checking for something. If something is true, I'm calling another function called process more. Now I'm wondering if I should wander up and down the aisles because that sounds like fun. Why not what? Find if. Yeah, uh, you know what? I already apologize in advance to anyone on YouTube and the people manning the cameras if I do actually end up going up and down the stairs. We'll see what happens. So why not find F? OK. Um, or maybe put another way, any, uh, any of, OK. Uh, yes, so uh, algorithms is what we're talking about here. And the, the general overarching principle here is raw loops. You're both uh, saying that we can use algorithms here. Algorithms are a handy way to avoid raw loops. Um, so I can do, let's see, I chose all of here. And I'm saying if all of the values are in this range, then I'm setting this value, and then I'm doing my if statement. So. Raw loops, uh, Sean Parent, he did not respond on Twitter, but you know, um, well, Sean gets known for this. Uh, if, who, who all has seen Sean's um, C++ seasoning talk? OK, so those of you who haven't watched it, you can go watch it. That's on your homework assignment. More code for you to look at while I get a drink of water. What? You have to yell louder. More algorithms, repetitive code. That's what we've got. OK. Anything else? Oh, pipes in the hose. Pipes in the hose right here. Yeah. It's what happens when you copy and paste code, right? Who all's made a mistake like this before? Yeah. If you're not raising your hand, you haven't been programming for very long. <clears throat> OK. So we've got, yeah. We've got this, hose in the pipes. Uh, this is a more general concept of multi-step functions. What I really wanted to call out was code like this, step one, step two, step three, step four. But if we can depose our code into functions and, or lambdas, I don't really care if you use a function or a lambda here, honestly. I mean, a lambda is a function, but I mean a free function that's been named. <coughs> now, just out of curiosity, who, uh, who prefers this version? I'm, I'm pretty sure I just heard someone yell, old people. Um, <laughs> scientist, okay. Uh, 
I'm sorry. Did did you just imply that old people are scientists or scientists are old people? Oh, okay. <laughs> people who like fixing code. Okay. So m everyone in the room is okay with this version. All right. All right. I'm okay with this version, but I often get people who uh, who who think that it it starts to get a little bit too much when you've got multiple lambdas and and such defined. <clears throat> I ask, are comments necessary in this code? Comments. Comments. Are they? No? Now, I don't have a slide that says this, but let's go ahead and indulge ourselves for a minute. Are comments a code smell? No, yes, and it depends are the answers that I just got. If it says what the code is, they are, is the, 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 the one person I've got right in the middle of the room, just for the record, that's actually, I think you're almost, you go to the theater often, don't you? <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, so it's an interesting question to stop and think about. If you've got a bunch of comments over your code that's explaining what's happening, then perhaps you just need to like, you know, name things better and maybe create functions and such. <clears throat> Functions are handy. They've been around for like 70 years or something. All right, multi-step functions. Uh, Bjorn, uh, Tony Van Eerd, Peter. I think Bjorn's the only person who might be in the room. Bjorn, are you in the room? I have no idea. Okay, too bright. What do we think here? Operator or order? Oh no no, we don't we don't have any problem with uh, order of operations if that's what you're saying. Const on the right hand side and the left hand side. Oh. All right. Just want to make sure that we're clear. So you said const on the left hand side and on the right hand side. So you're saying right here. Okay, all right, just, just wanted to be, oh wait, wait, do I want, sorry, const and data const, oh, the, oh yes, so that's what I was wondering. You want me to put it here. Oh wait, I'm sorry, what, no? Wait, here? Not here. <laughs> Okay, they do mean the same thing, yes, and we can spend an entire hour arguing about which side the const should be on, but we're not going to do that. Yes, we are. <laughs> Barbara will be joining me on stage to argue about the... <laughs> I don't care what side you put the const on, I, I really don't. <clears throat> I do think, though, as C++ programmers, we have to be used to reading it on both sides, right? Uh, depending, you might change jobs even if everyone you work, at, work with right now agrees on one or the other. Okay, so we are missing const on both sides of this. Um, oh, yeah, a lot of the code examples that I put up, by the way, are things that I have either personally done or are things that I have seen in real code. I don't just make up most of these things. Uh, I make up some of them, not most of them. Okay, so const and const. This is non-canonical operators is my code smell here. Uh, by the way, that was just me. I didn't get that one on Twitter. Uh, going back to this code, by the way, we corrected it. We've got hose times hose, not pipes times hose. What else do we see? No, 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 no. Uh, well, you said ranged fours, right? Precision loss. I am summing up. <laughs> uh, implicit cast to int. That's what I'm going for, but where? On the plus assignment. Okay, you're saying so on line 7 and 12. 
So we're making an assumption because we're multiplying by the MPy um, compiler con or the standard defined value for pi that we are intending to do floating point operations here, and we're assigning them to integers. So that's probably bad. Anything else? Uh, and the return is a double, and I'm returning an int into a double. Yeah, so clearly I'm not doing what I intended to do here. Size is unsigned. Okay. What? What's that? Hopefully, we don't know what the type is. It's probably unsigned. We're probably operating on a standard container here. If we're operating on a standard container, what is the return type of size? Size T, which is on our, who does 64-bit programming daily? Or maybe I should do this the other way around. Who does 32-bit programming? Oh, that's interesting. It's like half and half for people who chose to raise their hands. Huh. Okay, let's talk about our 64-bit platform. What is size T? 64-bit, unsigned. What is int? It depends. What did you say? It's signed. It's definitely signed. 32-bit signed, that's what you said? Okay, yeah. Not smaller than short, not bigger than long, but they can't all be the same size. Really? Sorry, sorry. He said at least 20 bits. Uh, what we know in practical use is that int is assigned 32-bit integer on every platform that anyone is using today. I'm not aware of any platform where that's not true. Uh, I guess maybe unless AVR is assigned 16-bit integer. And size t is going to be an unsigned 64-bit integer. So we're doing lots of conversions in this code. <coughs> OK, we'll move on from that. What do we think of this code? Can't see a thing from that corner. <laughs> Implicit construction of a string, says the voice in the front. Um, yes. Where's that implicit construction of a string occur? Line 10. Yes. Okay. So, ooh, I already had a string. Yes. Uh, who has done this? Yeah. Yes. The person giving all the answers, Ansel down here, is like, yes, I've done it. Uh, yeah. I make a bold statement here that says this always exists in code that has existed for a long time. You can go look for it in your own code later. All right. What is move? A cast to what? Cast to an R value reference. It is an unconditional cast, more explicitly, to an R value reference of the given type. So this. Is this an unconditional cast to an R string R value reference? Redundant? Preventing RVO. Yeah. What's that? Okay, so you say it's a pessimistic move. Um, it, yes, so we, we get warnings from our compilers now on this. I just wanted to go ahead and click on it. Moving a local object in a return statement prevents copy elision. So we have just explicitly chosen to make our code less efficient just for the fun of it. This is the return by move uh, anti-pattern here. And I realize I am going slowly, so I am going to speed up a little bit. OK. So standard move is another type of conversion that is a code smell. So just like implicit conversions with our C string to string, we've got standard move as a code smell. Now, this was just in the last talk on uh, undefined behavior is not an error. Um, 
What value is returned from main? Nasal demons. That's, I think, the... Your hard drive, your hard drive is formatted. Um, probably not those hard drive formatted here. I would just say, just for the record, on every compiler that I've ever played with, it does return the same value, but it is undefined behavior. So it's not good code. Anyone want to take a guess as to what the compiler is going to return? Four. Four, yeah. They, uh, it's, it's great fun, actually. <clears throat> and also, just for the record, no compiler warns on this. I can't help myself. I love that all the compilers do the same thing here. They set up, I just turned off optimizations, they set up the stack pace, the space, they move 4 into that memory location, then they move 13 into that memory location, and then return 4. It's a constant. It can't change. All right, so modifying a const object during its lifetime is undefined behavior. Const cast is another explicit conversion that is a code smell. All right. Weak typing, which int is which? This came from Arna. Uh, Arna first mentioned it, and then Matt um, clarified here the which int is which interface. This is great. If you just take a minute and stare at the socket API, when we've got, is it the domain, is it the type, or is it the protocol? It's terrible. Weak interfaces. But we don't have much choice in C. But fortunately, we are programming in C++. So code with conversions, implicit and explicit and cast, this came from many different people. Can our compilers warn us on this code that we were just discussing? We might get narrowing warnings. Now, interestingly, I just noticed this when I was reviewing my slides. This version goes back to the host times pipes. I think, actually, I could be wrong. I think PVS Studio would warn on this. Is there anyone here who uses PVS Studio? I come like one person raising your hands. Would it warn on this, do you know? On the host times pipes part? Yes, I think it would. I'm pretty sure it would. Because it does analysis of for loops that are beside each other, and if they look similar but wrong. Oh, right, we can't compile this one, unfortunately, uh, because I'm working on this data object that doesn't exist yet. But if we've, got, uh, if we've got our narrowing conversions on, W conversion, then we can get some warnings here. We did already see that we can get warnings from this one. I jumped ahead a little bit when I compiled it, and we saw that we get our pessimizing move style warning. So code with warnings. Um, Bjorn uh, and Dimitar Mirchev mentioned this um, and the, on the Twitter thread. What warning levels do we use? Who, who's, uh, who uses GCC and G, who uses GCC? So that's uh, like most of you. Uh, is W all mean all the warnings are enabled? Okay, good. No is the answer for the sake of the recording. All right. <clears throat> what are the implications of a static variable? What happens when I execute this function? What happens on line 8? St what's that? Static initialization may occur. Nothing happens. OK, so you know, I, sometimes I just can't help myself. We're going to end up having to skip something at the end of this, but it's fine. It's all good. You have to have a lock and an unlock to check to see if the variable is initialized. When I call do things, I blah, 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 set up stack, whatever. This is with all optimizations is enabled. On line six in the disassembly, I have to load a guard variable. That guard variable indicates whether or not 
um, my standard string has been initialized. Yeah, the first time this function is called, it's going to get a guard lock. It's going to check the guard variable. If I scroll down, it then uh, if, the, if it says that it has not yet been initialized, it'll acquire a lock. It'll initialize the string, and then it'll free the lock. So every single time we execute this function, it has to do this check of this guard variable. There has to be a switch here when this line executes. Um, with a trivial type, the compiler may elide these checks with a standard string. That's not going to today. Maybe with C plus plus twenty and constex for constructors for strings. It's maybe hypothetically possible, but this is the world that we're in. We can see that it has to do these guard variable checks and locks on this code. All right. Each time the variable is accessed, we do that. What do we think of this version, though? Ah, you said static is redundant. Unfortunately, it's actually not. Um, static constructs for variables are not static. Depending on this type, it is entirely possible and allowed that the compiler would still initialize this variable locally every time that the function is entered if we don't have static here. Static const expr is more logically correct as well because this is a value that is true for the entire lifetime of the program. But it does, it does go and counter to what we expect. We think, oh, because it's const expr, it will do this at compile time. Const expr means that the result of the value must be available at compile time. And, you know, if we were using it in a compile time context after this, then then yes, it would be required to do it at compile time. But in this particular code, certainly the static is not redundant. So static const is a code smell that should be const expr or const expr static. Static const. This is code that I found in, in a real library recently. I mean, you know, with names changed to protect the innocent kind of thing. Well, I have what do you think up there, so I'm just watching you all read the slide right now. All right, so I've got an extern int const, and then in my CPP file, I'm giving it a value. If I flip this code around like this, because when I compile value.cpp, this is what the compiler sees. What happens when I go to access that value on line four? Depends on what. Return the linked value. And it has to go and find this value somewhere. It has to look up some memory location. Unless we're doing link time optimization, it doesn't know the value of this. It's kind of like I've just said to the compiler, I have some really important information for you, but I'm not going to tell you. Extern const is also a code smell. Now, I would say there, there are places where it might be reasonable to do this if you're uh, linking in different object files that give you different values or something because you have a very complicated build process, but I still wouldn't say it's great code. Better option, const expr. We pretty much guarantee if I say what's the better option, the answer is const expr. So, um, what do we think of this code? What's that? No exception safety. I still didn't catch what you said right here. Sorry. Ah, you're saying I should use unique pointer. Don't use naked deletes. Oh, that's interesting. I've never heard it flipped around that way before. Never put anything on the heap that we don't have to. OK, we'll get there in just a second. So. Of course, this is wasteful, and the heap should be avoided if possible. But make unique is a better option here. So we're doing a raw new. We're doing a raw delete. We're doing manual memory management. 
As of C++14, at least, there's absolutely no reason to ever do raw memory management. Well, that's strong words. It's very, very rare that there's a legitimate reason to do raw memory management. OK, raw, new, and delete. Next code smell. So this is the code smells that we have come to at this point. Construction is separate from assignment. Output variables. Raw loops. Multi-step functions. Non-canonical operators. Code with conversions. Casting away const. Code with warnings. Static const. Extern const. Then we're getting to a part of the screen that you can't see, but my slides almost never go to the bottom. Um, raw, new, and delete. OK. But, uh, well, OK, come back around to that in just a second. Let's do a quick code review here. Um, we have time for this. Yes, we definitely have time for this. Tell me how I'm going to change this code. OK, oh, right, right. Uh, you said only have two strings. Oh, why have, all right, sorry. I have to take a step back and explain where this code sample came from. I got this really awesome magazine when I was in the UK last year, this year, beginning of the year, that was C++ and Python for beginners. Oh, I probably shouldn't have said the title of the magazine. Um, anyhow, uh, this is one of the examples from that magazine. So this is a learning C++ example. So yes, we have a bunch of code that's doing unnecessary things, but let's say that that's necessary for the sake of the teaching example to talk about variables and how we can um, uh, concatenate strings together in C++ and what functions are available on the strings. So that part we don't want to get rid of, um, but we want to just say, okay, if we're keeping this teaching example, all right, what should we do? Okay, let's start with string should be const. Ooh, string view. So I'm making my strings const to satisfy everyone. <laughs> okay, so inconsistent const declarations, yes. Okay, uh, move length to line 11. Oops. Wait, 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 wait. So, um, um, yeah, here's size t being said, but let's, okay. So, okay, so I've got, uh, well, uh, you're saying auto const, const auto, auto const. Okay, I've heard a few different things. Let's just go, I'm going to put the auto here. So const string, someone said const string view. <clears throat> I think our, um, our example starts to fall apart, yeah. So we, we can't do the concatenation if we're using string views, although I'm on board with the concept. Anything else? Well, we're not doing anything with the value. We'll get an implicit conversion loss uh, probably here, but we can do that. All right, anything else? Auto on line eight, okay. I'm sorry, this is bugging me. I'm gonna have to do this. <clears throat> You're saying, so, so the comment was it's better to append the string instead of doing the plus operator because that introduces unnecessary temporary. <sighs> we won't take the time to argue about that at the moment, but I'm, I would think it's probably a similar amount of work because it's going to have to allocate a new buffer and copy all of the bytes into the new buffer versus allocating a new buffer and copying all the bytes into the new buffer. It's probably similar amount of work. 
In 17, it will be move alighted. Which one? Ah, uh, yeah, it's always move alighted. You're talking about re the one return from the plus operator? In 17, it is guaranteed to be move alighted. We can't actually say that because we don't know about the implementation of the plus operator. It's only guaranteed to be move alighted if it is a uh, non-named return value from the implementation of the plus operator. So we can't reason about that at the moment. OK, anything else? Return directly to without length. Yeah, we could do that. I don't know. There's still one other thing that's like really bothering me, though, that's not just like a, what's that? Uh, yeah, yeah, explicit. You're saying um, using namespace is bothering you. Is that what you're saying? All right. OK. Or put it inside the function. That's fine. OK, so that's, that's where we're going to leave this example at the moment. There were several other uh, comments from people, for those of you who may be in the back of the room didn't hear this, that I could have um, avoided giving length a name. I could have just recalled dot size, or I could have just called dot size on the return value of greet1 plus greet2 or something like that. But I think this is getting OK for a teaching example here for what kinds of things we can do with a string. OK. One thing that keeps coming up, and we've only kind of mentioned it, what was it? Over and over again it came up. Use const. OK. We'll break it down. This one versus this one? Const. Return value versus out parameter? Const, line four, or on the bottom. Explicit loop, raw loop versus algorithm. Shows up again. Const, right here. So as we all just said, what kept coming up was const. This is not the first time that const has been mentioned at a conference, just for the record. This is Kate Gregory. James McNellis gave a talk together. I also have a clip for myself after okay. this. Marking everything const that you possibly can. Not like, oh, I have to, and then getting away with whatever you don't have to, but turning it around and saying, mark it const unless I absolutely can't. Because then, remember, the compiler is your friend. And so anywhere that you have any kind of errors of thought, they'll be caught for you. Does anyone have any ideas for how we might be able to get this to use less overhead? Did, did I hear const expert? Can anyone think of a simpler way? I'm sorry, but I just have to pause myself at this point. Because at this particular moment uh, at CPPCon 2016, I thought, at that moment, I thought, ConstExpert is kind of complicated. It doesn't necessarily get us what we want all the time. Now, for those of you who have seen some of my later talks, that might strike you as odd. Because since then, I've given talks called ConstExpert All the Things, for example. Uh, so. I had to just had to pause myself for a moment there because, yeah, I at the time thought, eh, const expert is too complicated. But we can see the disassembly on the right-hand side, and uh, in a moment we'll get there. Okay, to get Oops. this to have less overhead. What's that? Pre-computed table. Pre table. Uh, yeah, that could work, but const expert would kind of get us there, I think, anyhow. So. Is there some best practice about using const anywhere possible? Has anyone ever heard that? So what happens if we make our static ar array here of color data const? <laughs> so what I've, uh, I've had three years to reflect on this talk. What I've learned since then is by making my static array const, the compiler said this is const, it can't change, it moved the data 
from the stack to the um, constant data section of the binary. And then once it had that information, it chose to do more constant folding after that and optimize the rest of the code away. Can have real impact. Um, it's unlikely that you will encounter code like this where adding const makes your entire program go away, but it is possible. So with const, any lack of const is a code smell. That's what I will say. Const forces us into more organized code, it prevents common errors, and it encourages more use of our algorithms. But then we have to review when and where and why and how to use const. Should I const my value parameter? I'm talking about count, count here. Should I const count? You can't, you should, and it depends, I believe, were the three that I heard. Do you like bugs in your code? <clears throat> Does anyone see the bug in this code? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got plus plus count, and I should have plus plus i. Minus minus. Why? <laughs> minus 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 out, out, out. Oh, yeah, OK, OK. So let's see. If i is less than count minus. Except if count were zero. Oh, no, no, then it still wouldn't enter the loop. Yeah, you're right. Minus, minus count. That would solve the bug. Okay. <clears throat> Use what? Negative count. It's, um, yeah, so just for the record, I actually wrote this bug live in front of a class of students. I'm like, let's just make a quick for loop here, and I did this. But when I was writing it, I made count const because that is my reflex, is to make everything const, and the example didn't compile. So I was like, yes, best example ever. Okay, if I make it const, then it fails to compile in a good way. Uh, should, should string s be const? No, why not? Because I'm doing it to move, and then it's going to become a copy. So if we, want, um, if we want to actually do a move here, then yeah, we can't move a const object. That should be not const. Do I const temporary values, like on line 7? If line 8 exists, then I shouldn't, was the comment down here. Um, so again, we're, we're, we're breaking our move operation. This becomes a copy again. Silently reverts to a copy. Um, OK, I'll just, I'll just tell you. I have a little bit of circular logic here, and I love it. It's my favorite circular logic for myself that I've made. So I can't move a const object. So I made it not const. However, I just broke my main rule of making everything const. What's my out? <laughs> Don't use the name temporary, which is effectively what you were saying, right? Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. OK, so his comment was, you put the const first, and if it doesn't compile with the const, then you remove the const, and you live without the const. If the, yeah, so in some cases, the usage might require that you don't have const. I, I've been, it's rare. It's usually, and then I've got a, a comment in the middle that said, don't use the named temporary here. So. I can't move a const. That's not const. I don't like that. If I can, I can just go to this version. Okay. 
So in this version, I am going to be doing a construct and then a move operation. In this version, I'm doing a construct and then a copy operation. And in this version, I am directly constructing the string parameter in place. There is no copy or move to even reason about at all. Or write a function. Those are handy. We mentioned them earlier. So if I can give this thing a, a reasonable name, then I can take the thing that constructs the string and pass it to the thing that consumes the string. Do I const returned objects? Now, we already just discussed uh, not naming a thing, but is this code OK? No? Yes. What's that? It requires a copy. Who says, I'm going to get where I can see you again. Who says that this value is, requires a copy? Okay, who says it's a move? Who says it's neither? Okay, we got more hands with the neither, so we'll go with that as the correct answer. Yeah, no, this is okay. Um, this is okay. This is going to come into return value optimization in every compiler. Uh, that I have tested after 1997. Yes, every compiler after 1997 that I've played with, this would be return value optimization. Um, now what are we doing? What happens on line five? It's not a trick question. We construct a string, line six. We can start a string. OK, and then on line 9, what's it going to do, line 9 or 11? It's going to use one or the other, but what? The compiler can't elide the return, the copy or the move. It's not going to be return value optimization. Depends on our compiler technically here. If we're C++, pre-C++11, what do we get? Does anyone know? A copy. If it's 11 or later, it's a move. And so what happens if we remove, if we move a const string? We get a copy. So name return value optimization can apply. After C++11, it's equivalent to as if we have done this. So like we just said, this is unfortunately accidentally a copy. This is definitely not what we wanted our code to do. So we actually managed to break our return value optimization. We want to call it that, but it's not really return value optimization. It's just harder for us to think about it. But the compiler has to create the first string, it has to create the second string, and then has to decide what to do with the return value. So how do we resolve this problem? Lambda ternary. And I'm sorry, if ternary is the right answer, you need to rephrase the question. <laughs> uh, ternary is sometimes the right answer. OK. Um, all right, L uh, Lambda, someone said, another option. Any other options? If we remove, move the value to the return statement, I'm just going to, we're going to take an intermediate step first. This code does have return value optimization. It doesn't have to do the construction of both strings. It's going to execute uh, the correct code path and then do the, the return. So this can actually do return value optimization. Or we can do something like this, and we don't have to give the thing a name. Avoiding the temporary so we don't have to worry about whether or not uh, what the result is gives us the optimal solution here. I just tested this code, and it's in an episode of C++ Weekly that's going to go live. It's episode 197, so it's going to go live two weeks before Christmas um, with the Borland C++ compiler for OS2 from 1994, because I needed to know. That compiler from 1994 cannot do return value optimization with this code. It's going 
to do a copy on return. With this code and our compiler from 1994, we get the optimal solution always. This best practice has not changed in at least 25 years. I um, was recently compiling LLVM while compiling, uh, preparing for this talk, and I got warnings all over the place on this, this code that looked just like this inside of LLVM, compiling it with Clang. Um, line five, this is a warning because it is an unnecessary move. The local return value is going to be moved implicitly anyhow. Even though, so with unique pointer here, we might have thought, oh, well, you know, maybe I need move here, but no, you don't. Uh, that's, that's a warning. Redundant move and return statement. So do we const value return types? It's not meaningless. I got meaningless from several people. I'll explain. So first of all, this code is weird. I can take the return value from a function and I can mutate it. So apparently, in some books a long time ago, this was said, we need to forbid weird behavior like this by making this const. And now this code fails to compile. So if anyone, does anyone working on a code base that says that you should make that return value const? All right, not in this room. OK. This is not allowed with built-in types. This const is necessary to make our built-in, our, our defined user defined type behave more like a built-in type. We can do our value qualified at member functions instead, but no one does that. But we have this problem. On line 9, we are constructing an object. On line 10, we are implicitly doing move assignment because the thing coming out of this function is an R value. We're going to get an implicit move assignment here. What happens if I make this const? Can't move from a, uh, can't move from a const object. We just broke our assignment here. This becomes copy assignment. <coughs> uh, all of our compilers will warn on this, by the way. So we don't want to const value return types. It breaks move operations. Of course, we could have rewritten this code so that it never this issue doesn't come up. We can. Uh, this is still not a good idea, but of course, here if we just capture the return value into a named object, it's neither a copy nor a move. We don't have to reason about those things. Const and auto. So. Three main smells, and I am rapidly running out of time, so I'm going to go much faster. Missing and ignored compiler warnings. Special checks exist for these things. CVP check can help you reduce variable scope. Um, variables, variable can be const is a warning from various tools. The C++ core guidelines include raw memory uh, use checkers. We've got pessimizing move warnings. We've got const return values and cling tidy. So first one, missing and ignored compiler warnings. Second one, missing const and const expr and misplaced const. Either const isn't where it should be or it is where it shouldn't be. And using const forces us into, uh, or using const expr when we can, forces us into more efficient containers like standard array, using our algorithms and using numerics. This is a quote from me, east const or west const, I don't care use const. I'm also down at the bottom here, which is getting a little bit blurred out. I am not an almost always auto fan, but it does push us in the right direction because we have to initialize auto variables. And weak types and cast. Unfortunately, the C++ standard library doesn't help us here. String, path, const car star, string view, so many implicit conversions. Um, optional variant, shared pointer, have non-explicit constructors that contribute to these things. So we need to use stronger typing, see uh, items one and two, uh, so that the compiler helps us catch these things. For the rest, we just have to read the code, use auto, and use the correct types to avoid casting. And we can avoid named temporaries <coughs> to avoid using move. Of course, there's many other things. Most of the things that I found can be distilled down into these three. So. 
Sometimes the correct answer to why isn't that const is because it's not the right time to use const, but we do want to ask ourselves the question, why isn't that value const? We don't have time for the bonus code review. That will be in the slides later. So that's who I am. We've got 30 seconds left, so if anyone, we don't have time for questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, well, it's up to you. We've got 20 seconds. <laughs> Just a quick question or two, if you're interested. Now or never, so please join us here downstairs. One or two people and... Uh, we just have... No, they're already for lunch or something. Oh, here we go. Um, I wanted to ask about move. Y you said, and other people said, say it's unconditional cast. Yes. But uh, in, in the examples, we see that it sometimes actually allows move. Sometimes it doesn't. So isn't uh, calling it unconditional cast to an error value actually misleading? No, no, it is, it is actually an unconditional cast to an R value. But if you have a const value, it's still going to do an unconditional cast to an R value, but it now becomes a const R value reference. So it's, if it's a const R value reference, then, I mean, because it did that. It did an unconditional cast to an R value reference. If it has a const R value reference, a, a const R value reference will not match the move constructor, so it can't, or the move assignment, so it can't do a move operation on it. Instead, it's going to decay to calling the copy constructor a copy assignment. It is still an unconditional cast to an R, const, to an R value reference, just may or may not be const, and then things fall down. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So at the start of the speech, you said we have about 800 best practices. Yeah. And the thing I take out of your speech is that it's actually only one and it's to use const. <laughs> that is one I tried to get to, yeah. yes. Yeah. And all the other things basically come indirectly when I reuse const. I, I would agree, uh, except for some of these things like implicit conversions, const doesn't catch those. I honestly, truly, when I started preparing this talk, my goal was to say that there's exactly one best practice and it is to use const. But I realized wh I, I have to add the um, turn on all your compiler warnings to catch the rest of the things that const can't. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. There doesn't seem to be any more questions, so Jason Turner. Thanks.